Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. I have to say that this feels really weird because I'm actually sat at my office desk with no one else present. Just me and the recording equipment. No question and answer banter and no one to bail out or to bail me out if the words dry up. My reason for doing this is that I am one of an ever-decreasing number of small boat anglers still out there fishing off Lancashire who witnessed and took part in the start, climax and decline of the file course jumbo cod fishing era, which is the subject of this particular podcast. So it looks like it's down to me to put at least my slant on what it was like back then, and to set what happened into some sort of historical context. At the time, we didn't think to take too many photographs, or capture much of what was happening on video either, because naively, we thought it was always going to be that way. I do have a few pictures of some of the better fish, plus a bit of old VHS footage that has been digitally reworked, but other than that, this account is about as good as it gets in terms of actually telling it as it was. Looking back, and probably with some hint of rose-tinted spectacles, I can now see that it was a very special time. But was it actually as good as the press at the time made out? Were there really lots of 20 and 30 pound cod being caught all over the place? During the early to mid-1970s, Lancashire's file coast became arguably one of the most unlikely top big cod hotspots in the country. An accolade it managed to hold on to for around a decade, until the mid-1980s, when in the same abrupt fashion as they suddenly appeared, the big cod were just as suddenly gone from the scene. Whether or not their appearance was really that sudden is open to speculation, because small boating was very much in its infancy at the time, and the charter boats, as I'll explain in due course, were for whatever reason almost totally unable to share in the spoils, despite their numerous unsuccessful attempts. I suspect the reason why they failed has two linked answers, the first being boat noise in such shallow water at a time when uptide fishing was also in its infancy, the other being lack of commitment on behalf of charter parties, having to make such a large investment in terms of bait and boat cost to have just a couple of shots at a few good fish all day. To help illustrate this, one particular incident comes immediately to mind. Steve Lill and I were on our way back in, with amongst other good cod, a thirty and a half pound in the fish box, and we must have been talking about it on the radio, because as we passed Des White's Fleetwood Base charter boat lender hander, he shouted us over to show the fish to his party to prove that it could be done. A couple of days later, he followed things up with a phone call in which we discussed at length how we did what we did, and how, despite his party supposedly doing exactly the same thing, like the rest of the Fleetwood charter boats that made the run around on the bigger tides, they simply couldn't catch the things. In the end, we agreed to take Des out with us on the next set of big tides, and as if by destiny, not only did the weather drop right, but amongst half a dozen or so reasonable fish, Steve sneaked in another jumbo at thirty and a quarter pounds, only this time right in front of Desi's eyes. At the time, particularly in the press, Blackpool got much of the name-dropping credit for what was going on, but actually Blackpool was right out on the fringe of the real fishing grounds. The true focus for the jumbo run was an area of ground going two to three miles seaward from Cleveleys up to Rossell Point, at the northern end of the Fylde Peninsula. Exactly why the big cod chose this area in the first place is difficult to say. There are no wrecks, and nor are there any particularly outstanding natural features within the narrow inshore band from where they were all being taken. Nor is there any great depth either. At high tide, you'll be lucky to find more than 40 feet of water, with the bulk of the fish being taken anywhere and everywhere over quite an extensive general area of heavy ground from the southern edge of Loon Deep south to Bispam. Some people claimed they had actual fishing marks, but to be honest, we had no navigators back then, certainly at the start of it all, until the Navstar hit the scene midway through. I've actually caught fish on a mark and buoyed it for the following day, only to have other boats close by catching, while I've had nothing when I returned. 
There are a few bits of gullies, one of which they call the motorway, but by and large this is a general area of fairly featureless heavy bouldery ground, which seems to become progressively less hostile the further south you go. The seabed isn't exactly clean when you get down to Bispam and on in the direction of Blackpool, though once you get to the south of the Norbrecht Castle Hotel, it certainly does become a lot less severe. But nowhere is it particularly tackle-hungry either. The only time you seem to get hung up and lose gear even now is when either a cross-tide wind gets up or the tide starts to slacken, in both cases causing the boat to swing on the anchor, dragging the terminal gear into snags. And judging by the numbers of dabs, plus the odd ray, and in the winter hordes of whiting, there must be sandy patches and areas of light and mixed stuff in there too, particularly to the south of Russell School. On top of this, the water along the file coast, especially when it gets a good battering from the prevailing southwesterly wind, is often chocolate brown due to a stirring up of all the river sediments deposited in the area by the wire and loon to the north and the ribble to the south. In fact, if it wasn't so heavily coloured, then the chances of some good cod action would usually nose dive to almost zero. The probable reason for this is down to calm weather water clarity, allowing the cod to visually pursue small fish, particularly sprats, which they could then see and feed on well off the bottom clear of our baits. The ideal scenario was to have it blow from Monday to Thursday just to stir things up, then settle out on Friday and be fishable Saturday and Sunday, ready for another good blow the following midweek. Certainly on the bigger tides with plenty of run to keep the fishing good, but that unfortunately very rarely ever happened. As a result, the Blackpool area became the focus for arguably the best winter cod fishing in the entire UK at that time. It's funny really, because with the seafront attractions, and for the offshore reasons already given, I find it hard to picture a less likely hotspot. It was around this time that I got friendly with Keith Philbin, who would later go on to build and skipper the very successful charter boat Happy Hooker out from Fleetwood. But when I met him, he'd just taken delivery of several rolls of fiberglass matting, some drums of gel coat and resin, and had borrowed a mould which should have been for a 14-foot displacement boat, but had been stretched in length to 16 feet, and was about to start work on building himself a fishing dinghy in his garage. That's how boat fishing was back then. I've never actually gone to such extremes myself, though I have started with the burr hull and top moulding before today. Not many anglers go to those sort of lengths these days. The insurance people, for one, I think will be less than impressed anyway. On the plus side, it gave me a very good understanding of what boat building and design was all about, which is something I personally feel that I've benefited greatly from. That said, for many reasons, including safety and the horrible messy nature of fiberglass work generally, I'm certainly pleased to say that those days are long behind me. I'm not sure of the exact date when Keith's boat was ready to go on the water, probably around 1975. What I do know for sure is that I hadn't really cottoned on to the growing cod potential by that time. Maybe Keith had more of a finger on the pulse than me. Whatever the reason, we were up and running just in time for the winter, and got straight into action from the slip through the five-bar gate, just in front of Rossall School. One thing I can very clearly remember is that the winters back then were a lot different to what we've been getting since the start of the new millennium. They were certainly a lot colder. We also seemed to get a lot of freezing fog too when it was calm, and sometimes even when sea conditions were not that good. You could almost smell and even taste the fog, and we'd spend many hours sat out there with freezing wet eyebrows, wondering which was the way back to the trailer, because other than a compass, for at least the first half of the Jumbo era, we had nothing in the way of navigational or any other sorts of aids at all. You knew that if you sailed east you would eventually hit the beach somewhere, but many's the time we've come in and sent someone up to the prom to see just exactly where we were, then retrace their own footprints in the sand back to the boat, and give more precise instructions. And for all the inadequacies of our outfits, we'd be out there in some horrible seas at times too. Many was the day we came surfing in almost sideways up the beach, 
with not enough power in the four-horse seagull to keep the boat heading straight. Before starting a tricky run-in, everything that shouldn't get wet was stored away in plastic tubs, expecting, and usually with good reason, to take a few big rollers over the back the moment the bow touched solid ground. Then it was everybody quickly out trying to haul the boat, while someone walked up the beach and physically handballed the trailer back down. As if that wasn't bad enough, we had no roller coaster self-centering trailers back then either. A central spine with useless seas rubber rollers and a couple of side supports or skids was unfortunately about as good as it got. It was an absolute nightmare in a pitching sea to get a boat back onto one of those trailers. Then it all had to be handballed back up the beach to the top of the slip. Usually, we'd strip everything out of the boat and take the engine off the back to reduce the weight at the bottom of the concrete. What we'd also do is arrange to meet up in groups with everyone chucking in at the donkey work and using a launching trolley to take the weight of the tow hitch until all the boats were safely back up top. Though it wasn't really clear what was about to kick off in terms of big fish at the time, when I first started fishing with Keith, we still had some very nice cod to 21 pounds, though for some inexplicable reason, we also put in a lot of time using mackerel strips for the whiting early season. The whiting were about in the millions at that time, and for several years we also had to endure similar numbers of bait robbing pouting and poor cod, two fish that you rarely ever catch out there these days. Some reasonable conger too, grabbing at hook whiting, were also a regular occurrence in the run up to Christmas, and the odd double figure coalfish would, for some reason, also occasionally put in ashore. Where are all these fish now? These days, the cod season seems to be full of nothing other than dogfish, until the temperature drops low enough to push them away offshore. But once December came around, everybody's efforts would be directed solely towards the big cod, right through until the last big tides in February. After serving my apprenticeship with Keith, I decided it was time to buy a boat of my own, a 16-foot simulated clinker open-top Mackay Viking with a 9.9 horsepower Johnson on the back, which compared to most other outfits out there at the time, was like putting to sea in a luxury yacht. The age of the planing boat and big engines had not yet arrived, though by the end of the Jumbo era, they were starting to become more commonplace. But while it started life as an open boat, the Mackay soon had a cuddy fitted. Not only that, but also technology in the form of a little flashing light spot the ball echo sounder and a 5 watt handheld VHF radio connected to an aerial on the cuddy roof. And without any exaggeration, other small boat anglers would actually give this outfit envious looks. Nowadays we have radar, HDS structure scanning sonar, GPS mapping and a 90 horsepower Suzuki fitted to our Warrior 175. Even an AIS transponder. The only thing that's missing unfortunately is the quality and quantity of the fish. Those same people would often also look into the boat to see what we caught. And if they saw good bags of big cod, some topping 20 pounds, and at times well on into the thirties, they'd look at our fishing tackle and ask what secret baits and rigs we'd been using. It was laughable really, because living 25 miles inland, we only ever used frozen black lug, and our rigs were nothing more than 4 feet of 50 pounds mono, fished as a flowing trace with a 6 oar panel, loaded up with a couple of black lug. But you try telling that to them. They must have thought we'd changed our rigs for the simple ones on the way back in. In the murky lobby's waters around the file that was all you needed, along with lots of patience of course, a lightly set drag, and a willingness to put in the hours, obviously weather permitting. One of the lads I was friendly with at the time, George Hemsworth, who fished from a boat called AQ, and lived just off Gin Square, would not under any circumstances put to sea without fresh black lug which he dug close to the wreck at Little Bispam. George was also a beggar for going down and setting night lines on the beach, and very successful he was at it too. Some of the cod he caught in shore of the low water line would make your eyes pop out even back then. Sometimes he'd even bring along their heads to show us, but what he couldn't do, 
and never actually succeeded in doing was catch a real jumbo cod on rod and line. On a percentage basis, I reckon that we, and by this I mean our little circle, which included Brian Douglas, who definitely had more than his fair share, caught as many jumbo cod as anybody else fishing out there at the time. And in every single case on frozen black lug. Never on fresh. And we'd regularly taunt George with that fact. But he wouldn't change his beliefs, and was in the end overtaken by events. On one occasion when I was persuaded to try using fresh, it did nothing other than reinforce my belief that it was actually a disadvantage over the frozen, and perhaps I can illustrate why. I was out fishing in the daytime with Mel Jackson and George Adamson from the File Boat Angling Club. We hadn't actually done much over the day, but still we came in at Victoria Road and trailered the boat on the beach, so that we could nip to the chippy for something to eat, before going back out to sea again in the dark. George Hemsworth had given us a shout on the VHF from his house, and had popped down with around 40 fresh black lug for us to take out instead of using what he called that frozen crap. So reluctantly, I decided to give it a go. But we constantly got pestered by Whiting pouncing on it the instant it touched the bottom. As I've said many times over the years, too much scent will always draw in the more numerous and quicker off the mark unwanted fish. Eventually, I'd had enough, and switched back to the frozen black, which thankfully got me an 18 pounder before we packed up. We used to do quite a few night trips back then, which for some reason never really produced the goods, and with hindsight, I think I possibly know why. On occasions out there, you'd get the odd very small boat out fishing, not daring to risk running too far off, and anchoring up literally on the low water mark. We, on the other hand, fishing from our very much bigger ship, always tended to head that bit further off. But very often, it was they who would come back in with the bigger fish. It seems that the really big cod liked to hunt very close in after dark, but compared to the daylight fishing, we never really caught huge numbers of the things, though we did have the odd jumbo here and there. The best I can recall was a 34-pounder, caught by Pete Sharples on Kirsty 2. Going out at night was an experience all of its own. It's like sailing literally out into the unknown, with all the promenade lights behind you, and nothing except for total darkness out in front. And because you couldn't really see anything, it was hard to judge sea conditions too, so there were certainly times when we really shouldn't have been out there. Nights when the promenade lights would repeatedly disappear behind the crests of passing swells and when you have moonlight glinting on the slopes of waves at night, it makes them look five times bigger than they probably were. Two night trips in particular stick in my mind. The first was with Brian Douglas, who at that stage had a 13 foot open rana, which even by the standards of that time, still felt like fishing from a surfboard. We had two tilly lamps lit in the boat as we headed down the beach, but the swell was so bad that both of these were immediately swamped on the way out. Unfortunately, the unburnt paraffin carried on spraying out of the things all around us, which felt as though we were actually drinking the stuff. Vanishing prom lights behind the swells didn't exactly help much either, but we didn't dare risk turning back, so we sat it out until low water, and luckily had a few nice fish to show for our efforts. The other trip was in January of 1982. It was absolutely breathless, and the temperature reportedly dropped to minus 26. I remember the beach being frozen, causing the trailer to slide sideways on the way down. Worse still, the sea was also frozen for several hundred yards out. Not so much a solid sheet of ice as a jigsaw of flecks in pieces riding on the light swell. I remember vividly motoring the boat out through it, and looking back to see a black channel in our way that we'd cut through the ice. We had some very nice fish that particular night too. The problem was that not only did they freeze solid in the boat, but they also froze to the deck and we couldn't shift them. A lot of very big fish came ashore during the jumbo years, with the best one I personally saw actually coming aboard my boat. I had a new crewman starting with me that day called Garth Haslam, who sadly died a couple of months ago. This was to be his very first trip. 
but I also had a chap called John Langton, who I'd never met before, ring me up and ask if he could tag along too. We used to report our catches regularly at that time to the Lancashire Evening Post, which ran a weekly fishing section. John worked in the paper's printing department, and had got my number from Stuart Eisenberg, who ran the fishing column. Anyway, it was the 3rd of December 1982, and we met up with Brian Douglas and his dad Bob at the Five Bar Gate, and helped each other to get afloat. One of our favourite spots at the time was about a mile or so off in front of Russell Church, so we decided to head there. We'd invested in a Faruno paper sounder by that stage, which showed a gradual drop in depth over heavy ground, but nothing in the way of a feature. Most of our stops back then were made on the basis of either time on the watch, or rack of eye. Brian dropped his anchor first, so I went a few hundred yards away on the seaward side, and pretty much immediately we were into fish in the 7 to 12 pound bracket. Then Garth brought up a 19 pounder. Shortly afterwards, he hooked into another good cod, which at face value looked like being a much better fish. Within seconds, his other rod started going, so I grabbed it for him, and I was into a rod bender too. But then Garth's fish was gone, so I handed him the rod that I'd just picked up, and he finished up bringing a 38 pound cod to the net. Amazingly, it had five and a quarter pounds of row in it, and we were burly into December. Imagine then what it might have weighed had the same fish been caught mid-February. By that stage we had a huge purpose-built landing net on board, because when Steve Lill caught those two 30-pounders I mentioned earlier, we simply couldn't get them into our old net. The first one lay straddled across the rim of the net, which on the uplift spun, throwing the fish back into the water. Fortunately, he had his drag set right. When it came back up to the surface, I had no choice other than to try and gill lift the thing into the boat. So when history repeated itself a fortnight later, I decided we had to have a bigger net, which probably is just as well, as it wasn't exactly the calmest of days when Garth's big fish came along. The biggest cod ever to come ashore from Rossell was a 42-pounder taken aboard Frank B's dinghy by novice angler Mark Miller. Sounds good, doesn't it? But what I haven't discussed yet is the other side of the coin. Trips when you couldn't even buy a bite, when you would struggle to find a piece of water big enough to anchor up and fish in. That's how popular small boar fishing at weekends was back then. On a typical winter weekend, the rough ground between Rossell Hospital and the Royal Hotel looked like a small boat car park. Right from the very start we had the File Boat Club, and from the early 1980s, the Wire Boat Club too, which along with Frank B, George Hemsworth, Bill Ritson, Dave Waywell and others, I helped set up, serving on the original committee. And both clubs were full to capacity, probably even with waiting lists, in addition to which there were numerous privateers, as well as boats sailing round from Knot End. Some even sailed across from as far away as Morecambe. And yes, we did have some big fish, but we rarely ever saw a lot of fish. The best numerical catch I personally can remember was a day spent with Mickey Murs, when we had 12 doubles to maybe 15 pounds. The other side of the coin was long stints of waiting biteless for the rod tip to pull over as a jumbo made off down tide with the bait, and no two days ever seemed to be the same. The day Garth took that 38 pounder was the last of five consecutive trips afloat, in which on some days we obviously did well, while on one we could only manage a single fish between us. That's how unpredictable it was. The problem was, that you could wait for hours frozen stiff even for a single bite. Then for whatever reason, when one did come along, it might catch you on a worse and you'd end up missing it, with nothing else to show for the entire rest of the day. Quite often the rod tip would pull hard over, and on some occasions the butt would even be up in the air, and in risk of the rod vanishing over the transom. So you had to have your wits about you. But it's hard to maintain concentration for so long when you're cold, particularly when nothing seems to be coming your way. So a lot of empty time freezing your bits off, sometimes in horrible conditions, had to be endured. But when that biggie did eventually come along, it all suddenly became worth it. 
Then, probably around 1985 or 86, the Jumbo Cod run very suddenly petered out. There was a small revival a couple of years later that turned out to be no more than a flash in the pan, and from then on until present time, it's been at best just small fish. In some years after the Jumbo run, there were bumper catches of up to 40 and more 2 to 3 pounders per boat, with everyone saying wait till next year until they've doubled in weight. But it never happened, and things have gone progressively from bad to worse. I can't honestly remember the last genuine double figure file course cod I've seen, which is really quite sad. There aren't many compensations for growing old, but having been around, and participating when the jumbo cod were running, is most definitely one of them. As I've said previously, we had nothing in the way of electronics or powerful boats back then, but what we did have was some very good fish, and now some very special memories to cherish, because there is no way I personally can see it ever coming back. In my opinion, commercial pressure simply won't allow it. Though I should add that such a pessimistic view is not held by everyone. Everyone. 